For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. This is God's word for us this morning. God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path this morning through Jesus Christ. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Amen. may be seated. Well, as we're walking through Colossians, I thought it'd be helpful to just kind of recap where we are, where we've been, and where we're going as we spent a couple of weeks kind of walking really intently line by line. Uh, Just a reminder, Paul, the the church planter, the apostle, he uh, is writing this letter to the church in Colossae, which is in kind of modern-day Turkey-ish, that region. It's a young church. Paul has not been there before. His friend Epaphras planted this church. Uh, And it's really a a first-generation church, a first-generation of people who are following Jesus, who heard about the gospel, who heard about the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so Epaphras has been leading this church as they have been seeking to walk the way of Jesus. Uh, And there are some things that were bubbling up in this community as they sought to figure out, how do I follow Jesus uh, in this new way? And so Epaphras uh, wrote and visited Paul, and Paul is now helping them make sense of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. There's a lot of competing voices around them about what spirituality looks like, about what religion looks like, about what, who God is, and are there many gods, or are there just one God? And, and so Paul has written this to help them make sense of how to follow Jesus in a distinctly Jesus way in a world full of lots of options. So if we were to outline this, Colossians chapter 1, which we have been in for the past couple weeks, is all about who Jesus is. We walked through that hymn or that creed of early Christians. We saw that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He's God and human. We saw that he is over and above all creation. He was part of the creative act. Uh, In him, all that God is dwells completely and fully. He's the head of the church. He's the one in whom we are reconciled to God. All of that is who Jesus is. Chapter 2, he's then going to turn. He's going to talk about what Jesus did. What Jesus did. If chapter 1 is about who he is, then, then how does that help us make sense about what Jesus did? And that's what we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks. And then chapters 3 and 4, then how do we live in light of that? If that's everything that Jesus is and everything he did for us, then how should our lives be different? So this morning we're starting in chapter 2, but Paul has a concern that he wants to address with them first before he's about to move into then what Jesus did. And we see that concern in verse 4 of chapter 2. He says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. His concern is this, is that they have been following Jesus, but there are voices around them or influences around them who are causing them to question or to doubt the essential things about who Jesus is. There are arguments and voices around them saying, you can't have confidence in who Jesus is. You can't have certainty in who he is. You can't place your faith and trust in him because you just can't know that. There's reason to doubt. And so Paul's concern for them this morning is how they deal with doubt. I don't know if you've ever dealt with doubt, but doubt is difficult. It's confusing. There's a lot of voices. There's a lot of competing things going on around them. And so this first generation followers of Jesus are wrestling with doubt, just like you and I wrestle with doubt today. And so this morning, if I could title this sermon, I don't often title my sermons, but but I would title it one of two things. I would say, Jesus over my doubts, or how to doubt like a Christian. How to doubt like a Christian, all right? And since I'm sleep deprived, I have three very clear points that we're going to walk through this morning. So if I get lost, that's what we're going to go back to. Okay, so first, first point, we're going to talk about the place of doubt in the life of faith. The place of doubt in the life of faith. Second, then, we're going to talk about three paths to walk through doubt. Three paths to walk through doubt. And then lastly, the one proof that you're doing it well. The one proof that you're doing it well. Clear? All right. If I ever get confusing, just raise your hand and say, where are you? I'll be like, I'm asleep. That's where I am. So first, let's talk about the place of doubt in the life of faith. 
Uh, most cultural scholars and philosophers and people who think too much would say we are living in an age of skepticism. Right? We are super skeptical of everything. We're skeptical of what we see online, or hopefully we are a little bit skeptical of what we see online, because now AI can just create anything. Uh, but we're also skeptical of government institutions. We've been skeptical of government institutions, right? Uh, we went through an era of skepticism over like even just health organizations and doctors. But we're also skeptical of like the Supreme Court. We're skeptical of what's being taught in our schools. We're skeptical about whether what I'm seeing online or what I'm seeing in the news is trustworthy. And we're even skeptical of other institutions and organizations like church and Christianity and organized religion. Now, this has been always the case. I think it's a uniquely American thing, right? Because we had that whole, like, revolution thing. We don't want authority, right? We're skeptical of everything. But it's kind of picked up in the past couple generations. Right? There's a lot of voices and competing claims to our attention and to our allegiance. And so we're living in this age of skepticism. I came across one stat that said that as many as 60% of high school students who grew up going to church will walk through doubt and deconstruction after high school. And in seven years as a youth pastor, I saw that play out. Right? Almost like uh, 50% or more, would, would they were in the church, they were involved in following Jesus, and then they'd go to college, or then they'd, they'd go off somewhere, and all of a sudden there's a new experience, and there's new voices, and they would begin to question some things and doubt some things, and, and the statistics bore out that about half of them would just walk away and give up on Jesus altogether. And maybe that's where you've been. Maybe that's where you are right now, this morning. You see, the reality is that doubt and struggling with doubt has always been a reality for followers of Jesus because Paul's talking about it right here in the first century. And so it's not a uniquely new phenomenon to the age in which we're living in. But today we talk about it in a little bit, what seems like a little bit more elevated terms. We talk about deconstruction. Uh, if you've ever heard somebody say, I'm kind of like deconstructing my beliefs, or, or if you spent any time on YouTube or on TikTok, you probably have encountered someone who's like, let me tell you about how I deconstructed my faith. And there's this kind of new idea that to deconstruct something is to pull it apart and take all the pieces out and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of the things that I don't want. I'm going to reevaluate and reorient myself around these other things. And so you'll find a whole host of podcasts and YouTubers and TikTokers who, are, who will talk about how they used to be a follower of Jesus or they used to be a Christian and then they kind of walk through deconstruction. You'll even find pastors and authors who will do this. And so it's all around us. Uh, and what happens though when you go through something like this, is there's kind of two responses that you will hear. Uh, maybe you've heard this in your life. On the one hand, you might be in a, a church or a faith community. You might say, hey, I'm, I'm kind of dealing with some doubts. And, and sometimes the response is sort of like, well, don't doubt, just believe. Right? Like if I could just like conjure up enough confidence, I wouldn't have any doubts anymore. And so oftentimes the religious or the faith answer is just like, just don't listen to your doubts, just have confidence, just have faith. On the other hand, the voice that you hear outside the church, outside religious spaces, is don't believe, just doubt. I mean, don't believe anything. Doubt anyone and everything except for yourself. And so those are two very unhelpful answers. Because the reality is, I have questions. I don't have everything figured out. And so how do I deal with that? How do I navigate through that? Uh, notice what Paul says in verse 4, his concern. He describes this in a particular way. He uses two phrases. He says, plausible arguments intended to delude. Now, here's what he means. That plausible argument, arguments means that at a surface level, it sounds reasonable. And even the language, is, it sounds enticing. Right? Like, you know, when you're scrolling through like Instagram reels or TikTok, and all of a sudden there's someone talking to you, on this, and they, they ask a question, all of a sudden you're drawn in. You're like, oh, I never thought about that before. This is what often happens, is we are enticed. Right? All the, I mean, I think plausible arguments intended to delude is like a first century description of social media algorithms. Right? Like, like it's designed to draw you in and to get you to question and think about things. But Paul says behind that, the intent, the intent is not for you to have clarity, but rather for you to experience confusion. Right? Deluded, it's, it's watered down. It's people asking a whole bunch of questions, and their intent is not that you would think better or think well or think clearly, but instead that you would just question and question and question more things. And he's saying, look, their, their intent is not that you would see clarity. It's not that you would find truth, but rather that you would just question and question and question until you're just drawn away all 
together. They're not offering a valid, reasonable argument rooted in reality. It's just questions for the sake of confusing you. See, the reality is so much of our kind of current doubt and skepticism and deconstruction in the world that we live in is oftentimes, as I listen to it, it's very rarely actually about what the Bible says or who Jesus is. It's oftentimes people just asking some questions, trying to confuse you, trying to get you to, to think and ask questions that, that actually, they never offer any actually concrete answers. It's just there to get you to clickbait it and to engage it and to boost their algorithm. So how should we think about doubt, though? Because right? the reality is you will doubt. You will have questions. If you don't, you're probably not thinking well, or you're probably not walking through life. Life will throw you curveballs that will cause you to say, hey, how do I actually do this? I want to use that word deconstruction, because over the past year, uh, I was in a, in a process of deconstructing a bedroom. Uh, took it down to the studs. This is now the nursery, which, thank God, I got it done before the baby came. Uh, but there were two tools that I used more than anything else in deconstructing this bedroom and taking it all the way down, getting everything out so that then I could reconstruct it. I think these two tools are really kind of two approaches that you and I can have when we deal with doubt. All right, I have them back here. I hid them. First tool is a crowbar. All right, so this one uh, is good for pulling things off the wall. All right, so I live in an old house here in Goodyear Heights, and so I have plaster, and behind the plaster is lath, and behind the lath is, uh, is uh, insulation. So it's like three jobs all in one. All right, but a crowbar works best when you can get it against a stud, when you can find something firm behind it, because then when you get this little hook thing against the stud, you can just yank everything loose. And so everything that is not essential, everything that is not connected to what the room actually is, it will come apart. If it doesn't come apart, then it, it probably should not come out. <laughs> this is one way to think about doubt in our life with faith, right? Is that, is that we are seeking to find what are the essential things? What are the firm things? What are the strong things? And anything that can be pulled apart from that, maybe is not essential, Maybe it's things I've added to Jesus. But Paul has said, look, the firm thing that you can rest on is Jesus and what he has done for you. And so he says, this is the stud. Jesus is the stud that you should hang on to. That then when you're asking questions, when you're pulling things back, say, if it, if it comes apart and Jesus still stands, then maybe I've added that to Jesus. Maybe I should doubt that. But hold on to the stud that is Jesus. Hold on to the firmness of who he is and what he has done. And so one approach to doubt is the crowbar. The other one is maybe a little bit more fun when you're actually deconstructing things, uh, but it's the Sawzall. Now, I um, decided I'm too sleep-deprived and holding a microphone to plug this in, because that would be, I would cut my arm off. All right. But the Sawzall does not care if it is a load-bearing wall or not. Right. The Sawzall only cares about cutting things out, and it's really good at it. The problem is, right, unlike a crowbar, which is going to rest on something firm, the sawzall just cuts through everything. And so you have to be really careful. You have to be really careful that, that, that there were some times when I was deconstructing this bedroom where I started cutting through some things. And I was like, oh, hold on a second. I need to make sure that I'm not actually about to implode my whole house. Right? This is hostile. Right? This is hostile towards anything that is firm. And that's what you'll find in a lot of deconstruction around us. A lot of doubt. Is this not actually faith-seeking understanding? It's not actually good, honest questioning to understand your faith better. It is only intent on cutting everything down and leaving you with just a whole bunch of questions and the rubble of your faith. See, Paul and the early church are not afraid of questions. They're not afraid of doubt. In fact, you could say Paul here is saying, I want you to actually deconstruct the plausible arguments around you. I want you to think, but make sure you hold on to the firm foundation, the firm uh, belief in who Jesus is. You see, in the way of Jesus, doubt is not the enemy of faith. Doubt is not the enemy of faith. You can read through the, the stories of the Gospels and people who are unsure of who Jesus is, people who had questions or, or, or insecurities, 
people who are just wondering who he was, Jesus welcomed them warmly. In fact, there's one story where a man brings his son to Jesus. The, man, uh, the man's son is demon-possessed. And, and, and he comes to him. He says, Jesus, if you can heal him, would you heal him? And Jesus kind of challenges him on that question of if. And the man says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's where any of us are on any given day. I believe, Jesus. I'm seeking you, Jesus. The reality is there's still a whole lot that I don't have yet figured out. And so doubt is not the enemy of faith. You know what is the enemy of faith? Self-righteousness. You'll find Jesus over and over and over again welcoming the doubter into his community, but challenging the self-righteous one. The self-righteous one is the one who says, I have this all figured out. And I figured this out on my own. I went on my own journey of discovering truth for myself, and so I don't need anyone outside of myself. I certainly don't need a God who's going to tell me what is true. I found it myself. That is the true enemy of faith in the way of Jesus. It's not the one who's honestly seeking to understand better, but the one who's saying, I got it all figured out. And you can find religious versions of that, and you also find a ton of deconstructed versions of that, of people who say, I figured out why Christianity is false. And so follow me. See, doubt is not the enemy of faith. Self-righteousness is. But look at Paul's offering against these plausible arguments. He says, I don't want you to listen to these plausible arguments, but if you go a verse right before, he says, here's why all those arguments are silly. Here's why you would be foolish to chase after those arguments. Look at verse 2. He says this, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery. He's saying that you can, in fact, have full assurance and confidence in what it is that you believe, in who Jesus is and what he has done. You see, when he says God's mystery, he's not not talking about a mystery like a Scooby-Doo mystery, right? where you're like trying to figure out who done it or what's kind of going on behind the scenes. By mystery, he means you couldn't quite see it in the Old Testament. There are some things that God was doing in the Old Testament that now have been made clear in and who Jesus is. And so oftentimes, like sometimes you have doubts because you're reading the Old Testament. The Old Testament is confusing sometimes. I don't understand this. I don't understand why God would say this. What Paul is saying is everything has been made clear in and who Jesus is. He is the mystery of God now revealed. This one who is fully God and fully human, who is the fullness of God, now has come to us. But here's the picture that Paul gives. Look what he says. Which is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I love the picture that he gives here. The the word that he uses there for treasure is this idea of a treasury. And the first thing that I think of when I hear that word is I think of Scrooge McDuck. I don't know if you, uh, if that's too beneath you, think Bilbo Baggins in in the cave with all the gold, right? If you want high literature, it's him in the dragon's lair with all the gold. If you want just Saturday morning cartoons, Scrooge McDuck. Because Scrooge McDuck is a, like, super wealthy duck. And he has all of his gold in a vault. And the the best thing about Scrooge McDuck is is at the door of his vault, he has a diving board. And so he comes into his vault, he gets on the diving board, and he jumps off the diving board, and he literally just swims through his gold. That's how you know you have too much money. (laughs) That's a treasury. And so what Paul is saying is Jesus is the treasury of all that God is and all that God wants you to know. The fullness of who he is and what does it mean to live a life of wisdom and knowledge is found in Jesus. And so you are invited to swim in the depths of who he is. You're invited to savor everything that he is, to drown in the depths of how good Jesus is. And so he says, on the one hand, you can, you can listen to these plausible arguments, but you're going to be missing out on the Scrooge McDuck treasury that is Jesus. And so swim in him, savor him, dive deeply into it. You can never get to the bottom of who he is. You can never out-question the reality of who he is. There's always more of Jesus to discover because he is the treasury that God invites you to dive off the diving board and to enjoy and to know and have full assurance of faith. 
Oftentimes, the Jesus that people are deconstructing is not the Jesus of reality. It's the Jesus of our imagination, or the Jesus of my parents, or the Jesus of my culture. It's not the actual Jesus of whom is hidden all the treasures of who God is. And so if that's Paul's invitation to dive deeply into who Jesus is when you experience doubt or when these voices are challenging you, how do you actually do that? So I want to explore three paths, three paths to navigate through doubt. When you find yourself questioning or when you find yourself struggling with what you believe or voices around you are trying to influence you to think differently about Jesus, three paths to pursue that will help you navigate through doubt. Look at verse 6 and 7. It says, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Let's just stop there. Paul uses this picture of continuing to live your life in Jesus after you have received Jesus. You see, I think sometimes the reason why we struggle with doubt and deconstruction in our life is because we have primarily imagined Christianity and following Jesus as a sitting activity rather than a walking activity. What I mean by that is we think, okay, I became a Christian, so what do I do? I sit in church. Uh, I became a follower of Jesus, so what what do I do? I sit in Bible study. Uh, I became a Christian, so what do I do? I sit and I read the Word of God. And those things are all essential practices to following Jesus. But the primary picture for what does it mean to follow Jesus, what does it look like to, to know him and to trust him, is actually walking. It's dynamic. It's moving. We're on a journey from where we began with Jesus into deeper understanding and intimacy and knowledge of who he is. And the reality is, your faith and knowledge and trust of Jesus should look different in year 10 following Jesus than it did in year one following Jesus. Why? Because, well, you're 10 years older. You've gone through 10 years of experience. You've gone through 10 years of understanding the Bible and understanding what faith means. And so so the reality is, if faith is a dynamic journey, then there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be seasons of dryness. There's going to be seasons of doubt. There's also going to be seasons of growth. There's some things that you maybe previously believed about Jesus that as you studied the scripture and walked faithfully with him, you say, you know what? I, I begin to realize I had bad beliefs in the past. That's what a dynamic life of faith following Jesus looks like rooted in who he is, rooted in the scriptures and what he is doing. You see, we should expect that there's going to be change. There's going to be questions. I'm going to rethink some things. The question is, am I going to the stud or am I taking the sawzall to all of it? You see, much of my own journey right, is a process of learning some things, on learning a few things, rediscovering some things about who Jesus is. I can look back in my life following Jesus and I I can identify at least three significant seasons of doubt and deconstruction in my own life where where I believe some things and then I learned some things, I experienced some things, I I came back to the scriptures and I realized, oh, I actually, I was believing that not because it's in the scriptures but because someone told me that I should believe that. Even as recently as the past year and a half, I've been rediscovering some things about who Jesus is and particularly about what it means for me and my identity, and who he is. That's part of the journey of faith. If you read through the Old Testament, you'll find lots of stories of people who are faithfully, trying to faithfully follow God, and went through ups and downs. Went through doubts and rediscovering who he is. That's normal. That that is a sign that faith is working. Because faith is not a sitting activity, it's a walking activity. And so Paul invites us then to consider three paths. That as you're walking through this journey and you encounter doubt, or you encounter uncertainty, what is it that you should look for? The first path to walk when you're experiencing doubt is the path of deepening intimacy with Jesus. Deepening intimacy with Jesus. Look at the first word of verse 7. He says, rooted, rooted in him. Uh, this is a, an agricultural term or a, a botany term or a tree scientist term. I don't know what a tree scientist is called, but Uh, But it has this idea of of a plant rooting itself deeply where it finds water and nourishment. Uh, It has this idea that that when life gets hard, you root yourself more deeply into who Jesus is. Uh, Scientists are discovering that when drought comes, tree roots actually move. They actually move deeper and they move further out. Tree roots are looking for water. They're looking for sustenance. And so when, when the circumstances around them get hard and rain is not coming, what do they do? They dig deeper and they dig further in order to find what they need. 
And the effect of this is actually that through a season of drought, trees get stronger because their roots have, have moved and dug deeper into the soil to find water, and so it can withstand seasons of dryness. That's the picture that Paul offers to us, is that as you're walking in Jesus, one of the paths to navigate through doubt is to deepen your intimacy with Jesus. I mean, Jesus himself said in John 14, I am the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. He uses that picture of a tree, of a vine, that, that oftentimes when you begin to experience doubt or deconstruction, what you need is to, you need to deepen your intimacy with Jesus. You need to come back to who he is, to soak in who he is, to savor who he is, to make him the place where you go for nourishment and for life. Now, sometimes as you do this, it will actually fuel some deconstruction Fuel some doubt because you'll begin to realize, oh, part of the reason why I'm doubting this right now is because it's not actually Jesus. Right? And so sometimes it gets a little bit worse before it gets a little bit better because you start to realize, oh, this is who Jesus is. I haven't been following the real Jesus. I've been following the Jesus of my culture or my family. But savoring who he is is the invitation to walk through doubt by resting in him. In times of doubt in my own life, right, sometimes the only thing that I can do is to just open up the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and just read a verse from the life of Jesus. I did this uh, two days ago. I was just really tired. I was really, I hadn't slept. Things were hard. It had been hard to just find time to like pray and reflect. Uh, and so I just opened up in Matthew. I read a few verses from the life and teachings of Jesus. And it was like my roots had found that water for just a minute. While, while Judah's crying, I'm like, ah. Oh, Give me strength, Lord. <laughs> That's what we're invited into. Right? And so how do you do that? Right? If you find yourself in that space, and maybe this is the path that you need to walk, just simply reading and meditating on the life and the teachings of Jesus. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Don't overcomplicate it. Right? We have these gospels, these biographies of Jesus to show us who it is that our faith is in. And so opening it up and just taking a moment you may not have anything else figured out about your faith. You may have questions about everything, but Paul said Jesus is the treasury, and so go swim in the treasury for a moment before you come out and deal with whatever stress or doubt you have. Savor him. Deepen your intimacy with him. The second path is not only deepening your intimacy with Jesus, but developing your understanding of the claims of the Christian faith. Look at the second picture that Paul uses. He says, rooted in him, but also built up in him. Uh, the language that Paul uses here is an architectural image. Uh, it, has, it was commonly used like when they were going to build a temple. They would first lay the foundation, and then they would build the walls on that foundation. And so what Paul is essentially saying is this, is that you have the foundation of who Jesus is. And so what you need to do, or the invitation to journey into, is to say, what are the walls of this life with Jesus? In other words, what's the theology or what are the actual claims that the Bible and the way of Jesus make? Like, what are the things that Christians actually have believed about who God is and how the world works and what the Bible says and who Jesus did, is and what he did? To build up the walls of your faith by understanding this is, the theo this is what Paul did in chapter 1. So this is the theology of who Jesus is. This is the truth of who he is. He's building walls that you can then have a container to say, this is what I believe. And so when, when the winds of culture change or when, when the voices of your friends or your teachers or your parents say, you can't believe that, you have the walls that are saying, no, this is what I have my belief in. This is the firm foundation that I have in Jesus. This is who he is. And so I can rest in that. You build your life on a deep understanding of what you actually believe. And so much of deconstruction and doubt that I hear on social media it is actually just deconstructing really watered-down Christianity. Like, it's not actually dealing with the claims that the Bible makes or who Jesus is. It's not actually dealing with, with the reality of who he is. Most times, it's just deconstructing the culture that we've built around him. 
There, there's times you'll find that they're challenging core doctrines or core teachings of who Jesus is. That's what Paul is uh, addressing here. It's like, look, we can't say that Jesus is not God because he is God. And so if someone says, hey, you should think differently about Jesus, that he's not God, you're actually buff, buffeting up against what the teachings of the apostles say. So build the walls of your faith. Don't settle for a watered-down, half-hearted, consumeristic Christianity. Jesus light. Because you're just setting yourself up for doubt and deconstruction. Because you're not actually building the walls of your faith. I want to combine these two images for just a second as we think about this. Because the reality is some of us have empty houses. But some of us have no walls at all. Here's what I mean by that. Some of us, our faith has been primarily focused on building really elaborate walls, right? So we have really intense, elaborate theology, and we can argue the finer points of Calvinism and Arminianism, predestination and free will, eschatology. We have very strong, firm walls to our faith, but there's no life in that house. Paul's saying you need both walls and you need a vibrant intimacy and and, and an awareness of the Spirit of God moving in your life. You know what it's like to be house poor? You heard of that idea, house poor? Is that you spend all your money buying a really nice house that you can't afford to live in that house. And that's what some of us have been. We're, we're house poor in the way of Jesus. We've got robust, systematic theologies, but we have not listened to the Spirit of God in ages. We need an intimate, vibrant life with Jesus. And then we need walls built around that life. Some of us, on the other hand, we're all spirit and no walls. Right? It's all feeling it's all just, 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 just like intimacy and connection. And, and so you're just waiting for the next wind of culture or doubt or deconstruction to just blow you away because you haven't taken the time to actually build the walls to say this is who Jesus is. Jesus is more than just a feeling or a whim. There's an actual truth to him. And so you need to both build the walls of a deep understanding of who it is that Jesus is and what Christians have believed, but you also need that deep, vibrant intimacy with Jesus. If you have one but not the other, you're setting yourself up for doubt and deconstruction at some point or another. And so deepen your intimacy with Jesus. Develop your understanding of the claims of Christianity. There's some really good resources that are easily accessible right, to, to deepen your understanding of Jesus. There's no reason why. In the, in the internet age that we live in, we cannot work towards developing a deeper understanding of the theology of Christian faith. Because that will help you stand when the winds of culture and doubt threaten to blow you away. And so develop your understanding of the claims of Christian faith. Last, he says this, established in the faith just as you were taught. Established in the faith just as you were taught. The third path to walk when you're in the middle of doubt and deconstruction is discovering the riches of the family of Jesus. Discovering the riches of the family of Jesus. Paul says this, you have been established in the faith. Now here's the thing, most of us think that we possess our faith. In fact, when I was a youth pastor, one of the things that we talked a lot about was we want kids to own their faith. And by that we mean we want them to practice spiritual disciplines, we want them to have their own relationship with Jesus apart from their family, uh, apart from their parents, to to pursue Jesus on their own. And that's an admirable goal. But the reality is, you and I do not own our faith. The faith owns us. What I mean by that is, is like sometimes we act as if Christianity began the day that I trusted in Jesus. Uh, Or Christianity began the day that our church was planted. Christianity, the way of Jesus, the family of Jesus, has been walking this path for 2,000 years. And so Paul says, when you feel doubt or deconstruction, here's the good news. Christianity does not rise and fall on your feelings. It does not rise and fall on your doubts. It does not rise and fall on your questions. The faith owns you before you own your faith. Which means that you can rest in the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done, even when you're struggling with doubt and deconstruction. The faith owns you. See, there is a wealth of riches, of stories of people who have followed Jesus through the ups and downs of life, through the shifting winds of culture and politics for 2,000 years. Paul says this, listen to the people who taught you. Listen to the voices of those who have gone before you. 
Very, very rarely have I ever encountered someone who's asking a question or dealing with a doubt that has not already been addressed in church history. And we just kind of repeat the same questions over and over again. And most, almost every, I've never really encountered someone who said, ask a question that that just like stumps 2,000 years of people following Jesus. But oftentimes we're very ahistorical in our thinking about faith. Say, well, it's just me and Jesus. No, it's you and Jesus and a family of millions of people who have been walking this journey of faith together. And sometimes what we need to do is we need to actually expand our, 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 our reach of what the family of Jesus is, right? Sometimes we're, we're listening to only people who are just like us from our tradition, from our stream of Christianity. And what you'll find is people who are adjacent to you, like, like maybe they didn't go to your exact church or maybe they didn't, go, didn't grow up in your exact culture, but they're following Jesus. They actually have the wisdom that you need. But we're so myopic in our thinking about what it means to follow Jesus. And so we need to listen to and appreciate the stories of the family of faith. That could be stories from the Old Testament. That's the reason why we have those stories. To help us understand what does it look like to follow this journey of faith through ups and downs. You'll find mountains and valleys. You'll find depression and doubt in the Old Testament as people try to follow who God is. This means listening to stories of people in the family of Christianity from history reading biographies, or, or listening to the stories of those who tried to follow Jesus in different areas and times of life. But that also means you have to be in community. Right? Because the reality is we're in community and we are held together by this faith. And oftentimes what happens is when you begin to doubt, what's the first thing that you do? You stop going to house church. You stop going to church, you just tune in online. Why? Because you're afraid. You're afraid. You're afraid that if I say I have this doubt, or if I ask that question, people are going to look at me weird. And so what happens when you doubt is the very first impulse that you have, which is to withdraw and to step back and to keep your questions to yourself, is actually the exact opposite of what you need to do when you're going through doubt and deconstruction. You need to lean in and say, hey, I have a question, and this is a really maybe scary question to ask, but to ask it. Because your faith is not just about you, and it's not even resting on your shoulders. It's about you coming together in a community and say, hey, have you ever wondered about this, about Jesus? And what you will find nine times out of ten is three quarters of the people in the room have asked that same question. They were just afraid to ask it. And so if you're in the middle of doubt or you're struggling with that, don't lean back, lean in. And part of our task as a community that believes that our faith is not in us, it's in Jesus, means that when people are going through doubt, it's okay. Like we're going to help them find Jesus together. We're not going to look at them weird because in that moment, they've just been really honest with you. They've just been really vulnerable with you. And they are leaning in. And so what do we do together? We lean in to Jesus together. And so how we respond to people when they're like, hey, I've got a question. It's a scary one. It's a doozy. We say, good. Let's bring it. Get the crowbar out. Let's start pulling back some, some plaster and let's find the stud that is Jesus. That is the path that we walk. Lastly, lastly, my last point, the one proof, the one proof that you're doing it well. How do you know in the midst of all this that it's actually, you're on the right path? Because right? after all, it's confusing. Doubt is hard. You don't really know, like, am I going the right way? Am I not? Look what Paul says. Abounding in thanksgiving. The one proof that doubt is doing the right work in you is that you are overflowing with gratitude towards God. See, what happens when we begin to ask these questions or we begin to wrestle with them, right? When we're doing it faithfully as a follower of Jesus, looking for the stud, trying to pull back all the extra things that we've added to Jesus to find what is it that is actually true, what will happen is that you begin to have a much bigger view of God, and a much bigger view of who Jesus is. Oftentimes we have a very small view, but as I begin to have a bigger understanding of who God is and what he has done for me, I begin to have a smaller view of myself, and now I'm abounding in thanksgiving. I'm grateful to God that he holds me even when I'm struggling with my doubt. And so doubt and discouragement and disillusionment and deconstruction, all the D words, all of them, if we are seeking to follow Jesus through them, The one way you know it's beginning to do the right work is God is getting bigger in your imagination. 
God is getting bigger in your heart. You have a, a bigger understanding of your own need and your own struggle. And you know that actually God's the one who holds me through this. The reality is that all of these verbs that Paul used here, in the original language, they're, they're passive tense. Which means that there's a part of it that maybe we do, but actually it's more God doing the work in us. And so what happens when you go through times of doubt and discouragement is that when you're trusting in Jesus, you begin to get a bigger view of who he is. God gets bigger and I get smaller. Now contrast that. Where does deconstruction typically end? Most folks that I know or that I've watched who go through deconstruction, they get very cynical. There's this cynicism or this this biting to them where they've kind of torn apart everything else and what's left? Just cynicism and self-centeredness. Where nothing is good where nothing is good enough. It's just me and my critique or me and my criticism, me and my my disbelief. See, both these paths, right, through doubt and deconstruction, on the one hand, if you're seeking to find Jesus the stud, you will end up in this place of God is bigger and I'm abounding in thanksgiving. I'm abounding in gratitude for who he is and his goodness for carrying me through hard places. On the other hand, begins with the same questions but leads towards cynicism and discouragement, and deconstruction, and self-centeredness. Two very different end destinations. So the one proof, the one way that you can know as you're journeying through this, that this is doing the right work, and that you're participating with God in the right ways, is that he's getting bigger in your imagination, and you are beginning to overflow with gratitude and thanksgiving for who he is. See, the reality is, Jesus is the one who holds us. Jesus is the one who possesses us. He's the one who carries us. And so as we walk this path, what Paul is saying is your view of him should get bigger and you should get smaller. That's why the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10, he would say this, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Our faith is not dependent on us. It's dependent on Jesus and what he has done for that. And praise God for that, because if it was dependent on me, I would have blown it years ago. But he holds us. He carries us. And so let's look to him together and pray. Jesus, we thank you that you, there's no end to who you are. We can never reach the bottom of who you are. We can never get to the end of the beauty of who you are. God, for the one who's here this morning who's dealing with doubt, maybe they're discouraged, maybe they're leaning back. I don't think I could ask that question. I think people would look at me weird. Spirit, would you prompt them to lean in and say yes? You know what? I, 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 I want to have faith seeking understanding. I don't want the saws all cut and everything out. I want the crowbar. I want to understand who Jesus is. God, would we be a community that walks with you and towards you as an active faith, a journey faith, that's able to withstand the ups and downs. As we look to you who holds us, look to you who made the promises, who will fulfill the promises. Because in you are all the storehouse, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus, thank you for being good. Thank you for holding us when we couldn't even hold ourselves. We turn to you now in your name. Amen.